Good morning. It's good to see your faces and <laughs> not to see you masquerading as somebody. This morning we're going to be having a look at 1 John chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 7 through to the end. There's quite a few verses, but John seems to think this is an interesting or an important subject, and so he repeats himself a few times. Verse 7, we'll read this through. Verse, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been made complete in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been completed among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. But he who fears has not been made complete in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For, who, for, he, who has, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. As we read this, we need to remember that this was written by the Apostle John. Different people have got different ideas as to when. It ranges from AD 60 to AD 90, which means that it was written 30 to 60 years after Jesus had risen. It was written by the Apostle John, not the disciple John. God got hold of the disciple John and for 30 or 60 years he changed him. And as a result, we have this letter which is written which is so full of God's love. In this passage, there is, we've read 15 verses and in those 15 verses, the word love is mentioned 27 times. And every time, it's God's love. Not once does John talk about brotherly love. It's all about God's love. And I believe the reason for that is that God's love that, that was shown through Jesus impacted on John so much that he realised just exactly how important it was, not only for him, but also for us. In verse 7, he starts off, Beloved. And the love part of that is not brotherly love. The love part of that is God's love. Someone who, he talks, he said, Beloved. Someone who's loved with God's love. It might be saying, beloved, as in you who are loved by God, you who don't deserve to be loved, you are loved by God. He may be wanting to make that point. 
He may also be saying, Beloved, you who I love with God's love. Let us love one another. God loves us and God lives in us. Let us love one another. This love which comes from God and is in us, we need to exercise it. He knows that in our old nature we don't love with God's love. But now that we have God's love in us, we need to be passing that love on to others. Others who, like us, don't deserve God's love. If we have been born of God, we know God. We know that the character of God is love. You cannot separate God from his love. And if God lives in you, you need to allow his love to show in your attitudes and in your actions. If God lives in you, how can you not demonstrate his love to others? How can you stop it from showing? In verse 8, he basically says, the way that you can stop it from showing is if you don't have God in your life. Verse 9, he said, this is how God showed us his love. I was looking at verse 9 and 10. I thought, oh, he's repeating himself. But then, hang on. Verse 9, he said, this is how God showed us his love. He sent the Lord Jesus into this world to live amongst us and to die for us. But then in verse 10, he says, this is love. Not, not this is how God showed us his love, but this is love. He gives us a clear example of what God's love is. God loved us so much that he sent his only son into the world so that we could live instead of dying. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation is a word... I don't think I've heard anybody use that word except in church. Have you? I don't think I have. As a result, we don't have the understanding of the whatever of it in our daily usage. So I had to dig around. Propitiation means giving somebody something, paying somebody something, so that they are then favourable towards you, where previously they were angry at you. And so Jesus appeased God's anger, God's wrath, by paying him. Now, for most of us, that thought probably thinks about mm, bribery. However, the payment that Jesus made was the payment for our sins. He died on the cross and when he paid the penalty for our sins, that meant that there was no basis for God to continue his wrath or his anger against us because of judgment. According to Leon Morris, Propitiation is appeasement of God's wrath. A while ago, there were some people who, in a discussion, didn't think that it was right to talk about God's wrath because when we think of being angry, I was going to say 99% of the time, but um, I don't think that's high enough. Most of the time... When we get angry, it's wrong. We've got a wrong basis for our anger. And so they thought, well, if anger is wrong, then how can God be angry? However, when we look through the Old Testament, we find that there are many, many times when it talks about God's wrath. And at one point I thought, mm, well, God's wrath, well, that's it. God's anger is a, a logical response to our sin. And then I came across a few verses where it talks about God burning with anger. I thought, okay, it's not just logical. There's emotion there as well. When God is angry at sin, it's not just, uh, okay, cross on the, the bit of paper. God is angry at our sin. And the Lord Jesus, when he paid the penalty for our sin, 
he turned away God's wrath. He appeased God's wrath against us. And John says, Beloved, you who have God's love, show that love to one another. Paul says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord Jesus demonstrated that love not just to his friends. Because at that point in time, there was nobody who had God living within them like we do today. So everybody around Jesus was an enemy. They were opposed to what God was about. They did not have the love of God in them. And John's saying here, we need to be living and loving those around about us that get under our skin, those around about us who, who are not lovable. Not only should we love those who are, love, who are kind to us, but we need to be loving those who are not lovable. The question for us is, do we have the love of God in us? Do we love all those around us? All of those here. As I look around... There's lots of different people with lots of different backgrounds. And we've all grown up with different understandings and different thinking about different things. Are there people here who get under your skin because of who they are, because of what they've grown up with? They're thinking about something. John's saying that we need to be loving, not just those who are lovable, but those who get under our skin. John said, Jesus laid down his life for us. That's the love that we need to have. If God loved us, in verse 11, we should also love one another. When he says love one another, what is he thinking of? What does he mean? It means we should love others with God's love. And what's God's love? Laying down his life for us. What a challenge for us. Are we prepared to lay down our life for anybody here in this church? For our other brothers and sisters who are not in this church I've come across a few people from other denominations some of them have got <laughs> more differences than others however after talking with them I'm convinced that they are my brother or sister and in spite of those differences, am I willing to lay down my life for them? What a challenge, isn't it? In verse 12, he says, No one has seen God at any time. Now, John the Baptist made this same statement as well, and he proceeded to say, that Jesus declares or shows us God. And I think that John is doing the same thing here. John is saying that no one has seen God, but by God's love in us, they can see God. They can see God living and loving because God lives in us. And God's love has been perfected in us, or has been made complete. When I first read that, I thought, oh yeah, because of God's love, I'll be made complete. And then I wait a minute, that's not what it says. It says, God's love is made complete in us. God has, that's God's plan. God's plan is,
for his love to be demonstrated in us and through us to all those around about us. God's love is made complete in us. As God lives in us and loves others through us, the plan of God's love through us is made complete. And as we love others, God's plan for his love in us and through us completes what God wants to do. And not only does God live in us every day, every moment of the day, but he wants us to live in him every day, every moment of every day. We need to walk each day with Jesus beside us, not ignoring him, but walking with him and talking with him and including him in all that we do and think about. He says, God has given us of his spirit. Now we often talk about having the Holy Spirit within us. However, as we look through this passage, I think it's pretty obvious that John doesn't consider the Holy Spirit to be here and the Father here and the Son here. As I read this, it appears to me that John is saying, if you have the Spirit, you have the Father and you have the Son. If you have the Son, you have the Father and you have the Spirit as well. We cannot separate the three. And there are many times throughout the Bible where God talks about living in us. And as Jesus said, if you have the Son, you have the Father. So it's not only the Holy Spirit who lives within us. We also have God the Father and God the Son living within us. God is a trinity, three parts of one, not three different people. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son into the world. In the previous verses, John uses we and us in a way that not only includes the disciples, but it also includes us who now believe in Jesus. When he says we have seen and testify that the Father sent the Son into the world, does that mean us as well? Are we included in that? As we have seen in, in the previous verses, and with regard to the one where John says, no one has seen the Father at any time. I think that John is continuing that thought here. And he's saying, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son into the world. Not just the disciples, but us as well. As we look at each other, as we, with God living within us, as we love each other, and as we show God's love, people will see and testify that the Father has sent the Son into the world because they are looking at us. What a challenge. What a challenge for us that people can look at us and see. The first hymn in this book is a, is a verse, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. We need to be loving. But then Jesus goes on, he says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. People are going to see God living out in us. They're going to see Jesus they're going to be able to see that God sent Jesus into this world as a saviour when they look at us. They should be able to be a, some they should be able to point at us and say, I can see in your life that the Father has sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. 
in verse 15, that doesn't mean that we don't need to say anything. We do. Part of showing and living out God's love is saying that Jesus is the Son of God. When God lives in us and we live in God, this is what happens. We say, we declare, we confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And in verse 16, John says, And we have known and believed the love God has for us. John has seen Jesus show his love, God's love, to those who read about him while he was here on earth. And to all those who didn't have God's love. And John has seen God's love revealed in the lives of those who, after Jesus was crucified and raised, had to accept Jesus as Saviour. And those who now have God living in them, and they are living in God. And John includes himself in us. He saw the change that God had made to him after God came and lived in him and loved through him. And this was so important that John has to repeat it again and again. John repeats it, God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And in this way, God's love is made complete amongst us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment because in this, in this world we are like him. John says love is made complete amongst us. Previously he'd been saying God's love is made complete in us. And now he said God's love is made complete amongst us. God's plan is not for us as individuals. God's plan is for his body, the body of Christ. And each one of us should be demonstrating God's love to each other. So that what John's talking about here, love is made complete amongst us between us, between each one of us. God's love, God's plan is for his love to fill us and to flow on to all those around about us. And when, God, when God's love lives in us and we in God's love, God's plan for his love is complete. For we shall be like him and we shall be living out God and living out his love in our lives every day. Jesus died on the cross and took the punishment for all of my sins and yours. And there is, near, there is now no barrier between me and God. The relationship between me and God has been restored. I have been reconciled to God. Because I have been reconciled to God, God can now live in me and I in God. And God's love can fill me and overflow on being sanctified because God's love which is in us is pure and holy we can have confidence in the outcome at the day of judgment because Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins we have no reason to fear and we have no reason to fear the outcome because the punishment has been dealt with there is no punishment no reason to fear when God's love is completed in you and me. Because of God's love in us, we love others. In verse 19, John reminds us again, before God came to live in us, God's love did not exist in us. We did not love anyone with God's love. Before God came and lived in us, and this applies to John just as it does to us, John then challenges us to consider our love, God's love in our lives. How do we treat our brothers and sisters? God's love is for all. There's no exemptions and there's no excuses. Do we allow our old nature to block God's love to one or another of our brothers and sisters? 
if we allow our nature to block God's love to one, we block God's love to all. God's love can't flow through us if we block it. God's love is to all with no favourites or, exem or exemptions. John says, how can we love God if we love our brother? John reminds us again in verse 21 that Jesus had commanded us to love one another. And I've referred to that song in, in, verse, in John 13, 34, which is where it's come from. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. In John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And in 1 John, he's already mentioned it. This is his commandment, that, should, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. We need to be demonstrating God's love. Now, 21, verse 21 was supposed to be my last verse. But I'm going to refer, refer also to verse 1 in the next chapter. And I hope Kevin doesn't mind. Because I believe that it is a, like a summary or a, it's, it's definitely a connection to the previous passage. And I don't mind if you repeat it or refer back to my chapter of that. In the first verse, it says, everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. I found it very interesting that... Yeah, where's my... Yeah. That that is very similar to verse 7. In verse 7, we read... It says, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And this one here says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Slightly different, but I think that there's, uh, they're like bookends, I think. John wants us to be loving, to be loving everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ and has been born of God. As I was going through this passage, there was a song that came to my mind, number 411. I thought it would be good for us to sing it. 411, let there be love shared among us. Let there be love in our eyes. But then as I read it through, I thought, hang on, they've made a big mistake. I don't know if you have noticed the change that I've asked Richard to make. But I think that the original one has a, a big mistake. Let me explain. Halfway down, he says, give us a fresh understanding of brotherly love that is real. After going through this passage, I thought, that's not right. That's not what God wants. The Apostle John, in this book, the whole book, never once says brotherly love. It's always God's love. So I've asked Richard to kindly make a change there. Give us a fresh understanding of God's love in my life. Now, you will notice that there's a slight difference in the, um, the beat. However, God's love will never fit in with brotherly love. So we'll put up with that. And we'll focus on God's love rather than brotherly love. Let's sing this one through, please. <laughs> 
that people can see God's love in our lives as we go out this week.